This is an audio rendition of chapter 12 of Dave Roberson's book, The Walk of the Spirit, The Walk of Power, subtitled, The Vital Role of Praying in Tongues, as read by me, Keith Davis. Each chapter starts with the prophetic message at the beginning. I begin by reading this message. As you yield yourself to my spirit, then my presence will work in you, illuminating you and searching the inward parts of your belly, that you might understand what my will is. I will lead you beside the streams of water. I will sink your root system deep, that you might manifest the kind of fruit that is born of my spirit. So hear what the Spirit would say, because in that day many shall cry, but you shall be established on the rock of doing my sayings. You will be one whom I can move through. Chapter 12 Purged to Stand in the Gap I'll tell you another good reason why it's so important not to give up on prayer when you reach an impasse. You'll never be able to stand in the gap for others the way God intends if you remain an unpurged vessel. Before we can enter deeply into intercession, we must experience a certain degree of mortification of the flesh nature. Intercession requires dedication, determination, and endurance. Generally, each of these attributes is contrary to the flesh. Why prayer groups often fail. That's why so many prayer groups fail, even though they begin with the best of intentions. Most people who join a prayer group don't possess stamina, commitment, or dedication. In fact, what they usually have is a whole boatload of excitement and a tongue of character flaws. These people join a prayer group thinking that they'll spend the time pulling down great spiritual strongholds over the city as they pray in tongues. But, in reality, all they are really doing in the beginning is edifying themselves, not interceding for others. If they stick with it, this edification process will cause the character flaws that have hindered them in the past to surface. The Holy Spirit will bring them face to face with the root that has borne the bad fruit. In other words, the works of the flesh in their lives that have caused them not to be a good mama, a good daddy, a good provider, etc. Raging tempers may arise in those who seemingly never had that kind of temper before. But the capacity for these fleshly traits was there all along. Praying in tongues just caused them to surface. Now it is up to the people to continue in prayer, allowing the Holy Spirit to edify the reborn spirit until it is able to purge the very root of those traits away. If the prayer group members don't deal with these revealed faults, soon they will disband over petty arguments, false doctrines, or just plain selfishness. But if they'll keep on praying, the Holy Spirit will finally get them to the place where He can take the emphasis off of their personal edification and release His power through them on behalf of others. So the devil works on keeping believers in a state of carnality. Many churches remain in that state always fighting each other, always in turmoil. In that state of carnality, believers are not qualified for intercession because they don't care enough that sick children are dying. They don't care that multitudes are going to hell. They are too concerned about their own rights. We should desire to be great intercessors. God wants to place us between hell and those who are trying to get there. But first, we must desire to mortify the deeds of the flesh. Stand steadfast in intercession. However, we must remember that we cannot actively pray for the salvation of souls and for revival without attracting the devil's attention. Paul warned us about an impeding war, impending war in Ephesians 6. He said, Look, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We aren't fighting with a sword or a spear, but the war is just as real. We wrestle against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high heavenly places, Ephesians 6:12. Therefore, you have to determine to steadfast to stand steadfast in intercession 
cooperating all the time with the Holy Spirit's mortification process that continues within. As you edify and build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, you will attain a place in the Spirit where God can literally pour the deep intercessional groanings through you. That's when incredible, mega amounts of Holy Ghost power begin to be released. The amount of spiritual activity that goes into operation when God's power is delivered to a person to genuinely stand in the gap is phenomenal. This kind of power authorizes a host of angels to take legal action in others and in your affairs to ward off cast catastrophes and change circumstances. But this level of intercession also attracts powers and principalities to challenge your authority. These demonic powers will move in on you with the vengeance of a freight train. Their target will be any weaknesses or character flaws that they can use to stop and destroy you, such as your susceptibility to ungodly lusts or just plain procrastination. That's the reason the months and months of edification through praying in tongues are so important. During that time, the Holy Spirit edifies your reborn human spirit to put to death any forces of the flesh giving the devil authority and power to hinder and control your life. He builds your spirit to such a place of spiritual maturity that the enemy can't stop you. Once you have reached that place of an enduring prayer, the Holy Spirit will begin to activate incredible waves of glory, power that floods over your soul in the form of supernatural joy and hilarious laughter. These waves of glory are enjoyed by people who have mastered the art of enduring prayer and are being used by God to rescue others from physical disaster or eternal hell. The supernatural joy and laughter is a report from the realm of the Spirit that faith has obtained the answer. Something has changed and it will soon be manifested in the natural realm. So how can we be confident of final victory in this situation? spiritual quest from selfish carnality to enduring in prayer through the purging process to become becoming a pre prepared vessel that the Holy Spirit can use in intercession? I found an answer to that question in my studies and meditation of two different passages of Scripture, 2 Corinthians 5 and Romans 8. The key to our ultimate victory is summed up in one simple statement in 2 Corinthians 5.5 5. God has given to us the earnest of the Spirit. Let's look at the entire passage in context. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this earthly tabernacle we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven, our glorified bodies. If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, we don't just want to die, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 5, 1-5 through 5. Now let's go to Romans 8, 22-25 and compare the two passages. First, let's look at verse 22. For we know that the whole creation, every created thing, groaneth and travaileth, as a pregnant woman, in pain together until now. All creation groans for its deliverance from the bondage of corruption, in which it was placed at the fall of man. All of creation, right down to the last Adam, came under a curse at that time. Now creation, pregnant with a new heaven and a new earth, groans in travail like a pregnant woman waiting to give birth. Then in verse 23, Paul switched the emphasis from creation to you and me. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. Everything in creation that is imperfect is in a form of intercessional groaning, waiting to be delivered from corruption. That includes believers who have the first fruits of the Spirit. 
Notice Paul said that we have the first fruits and we wait for the second fruits. The redemption of our bodies. What are the first fruits Paul is talking about? Jesus died and rose from the dead, and those of us who are born again have become the first fruits, the first harvest of his resurrection. When we bowed our knee to the Lord Jesus Christ and were born again, adoption papers were served on us, and we became his first fruits. When I was born again, my spirit man was instantly seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 5 and 6 My spirit has taken on the express image of Jesus Christ. It has been born of him, and consequently has become the righteousness of God in Christ. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5:21. Therefore, on the inside of me, I have these righteous feelings. Something in me is so holy that it constantly wars with my flesh. We who have the first fruits of the Spirit, in other words, we who are born again and have received the earnest or baptism of the Holy Spirit, are groaning. We groan within our righteous spirits, waiting for the entire adoption process to be culminated or completed at the redemption of our bodies, the second fruits. The reason you are groaning on the inside of your righteous spirit is that you are imprisoned in your fleshly body. You live in there. Your flesh has death working in it, inherited from the first Adam. It is not only capable of sin, it will sin if you let it. That's why Paul says in Galatians 5.16, This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You are totally capable of walking in the flesh. Even more than that, your body is imprisoned in a world of warring and strife, a place where children are starving to death and men kill each other, where sin and perversion run rampant. Your righteous spirit groans within your body because you're in an imperfect world that has all this damnable sin and you are still capable of practicing it yourself. In fact, Paul said that all creation is travailing like a pregnant woman sold to the bondage of slavery, crying and groaning to be delivered out of that bondage. I am in the middle of all this mess, and the righteousness that has been implanted within me makes me groan for a new heaven, a new earth, and a new glorified body. Saved by hope. This is starting to sound like the passage in 2 Corinthians 5, isn't it? Remember what verse 4 says? For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. What are we groaning for? We are waiting for our adoption process to be made complete. When? At the redemption of our bodies. In other words, when we are clothed with our glorified body, a house from heaven not made with hands. When Jesus returns, our bodies will be changed in the twinkling of an eye from corruptible to incorruptible as we receive receive our resurrected bodies, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. That time is coming. But in the meantime, while we are still imprisoned in our bodies, we need someone to help us. That's why God gave us the Holy Spirit to empower us during this time of waiting to have victory over the dominance of the flesh. Then, in 2 Corinthians 5, 5, Paul goes on to say this, Now he that hath wrought or saved us from the self same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. So God has wrought or saved us from the culmination of his great plan. Actually, Paul is saying the same thing, but in a slightly different way to both the Romans and the Corinthians. In Romans 8, 24 and 25, he said, We are saved by hope. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. We are saved by the hope of what? We who have the first fruits of the Spirit are waiting for the redemption process to be made complete at the resurrection and glorification of our physical bodies. We don't see it yet, 
So we do, with patience, wait for it. We don't have any choice but to wait. We can believe God for Jesus' return until we turn blue and seven shades of white and green, but Jesus is still going to come back when God says it's time for him to come back. The earnest of our inheritance. Notice what else Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.5 5, as he encompasses the entire ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives in this one simple statement. God gave us the earnest of, earnest of the Spirit. To find out more detail about the Holy Spirit's ministry as the earnest of our inheritance, we have to go back to Romans 8. Paul says, in essence, it doesn't matter if you're imprisoned in a body that is capable of sin. Sure, you're still trapped here in glory, hope of a glorified body, but you don't have to wait alone. You have the earnest of the Spirit. And this is how the Holy Spirit carries out that ministry. If you're at all familiar with the real estate business, you know what earnest money it is a token of your sincerity to make the purchase. It is money against the promised possession. Well, when you were born again, God said, I'm going to give you a little bit of heaven to go to heaven with. Because when this purchase is finished, I want you, the promised possession, to come home to be with me. So God put his earnest money, the Holy Ghost, down on you against the promised possession. In other words, God sent the Holy Ghost as the earnest of our inheritance to guarantee us three things. 1. The Holy Spirit is God's guarantee of the power to fulfill your ministry here on earth. He offers himself in edification through the supernatural language of tongues to pray the plan of God into your life. He is your only true promise of power and of divine direction and leadership to fulfill your ministry. His is the only earnest that will see you through. No other path holds that guarantee. He is your guarantee of a glorified body. He is the power to finally deliver the purchased possession, you, to God as he brings you on home to heaven. So the earnest of the Spirit guarantees to help you fulfill your ministry to deliver you to your glorified body and to bring you home to heaven. That is God's guarantee to you. If you follow him, he will never lose his earnest money against the promised possession. Never. As you use that basic diversity of tongues, called tongues for personal edification, you begin to instigate the earnest of the Spirit. At that level, the Holy Spirit starts to deal with all of your problems, no matter how bad they are. If you keep yielding to his work in you, he will deliver you out of them all. The Ministry of the Earnest Paul describes how the Holy Spirit carries out his ministry of the earnest in Romans 8:26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. We know from our earlier discussion that the word infirmities refers to our inability to produce results because of the limitations imposed on us by the flesh. That's why we who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown out of our righteous spirits. We desire that these limitations be removed, and the Holy Spirit in like manner helps our infirmities. I appreciate the Holy Spirit's help because I found out long ago that I'm not too smart when it comes to producing results in spiritual matters. For example, when I looked at a crippled, deformed child in a wheelchair and come face to face with my inability through unbelief to produce results, my righteous spirit groans inside of me. If I knew how to pray as I ought, that child in the wheelchair would rise up whole and normal and walk. So the Holy Spirit has to help my inability to produce that result. You see, we all have a call and a place in God's plan, even that severely handicapped child in the wheelchair. What glad tidings should we be preaching to that child? Little believer, you don't have to be that way anymore, because that wasn't in God's plan. You have a divine call just like I do. And unless the church can help set you free from that condition, you will never fulfill that call as God intended. 
If that isn't our message, then what good is the gospel? Is it only for good-looking people who have money in their pockets and drive a Lexus? Do we think the little deformed child is any less called by God than ourselves? The preacher's message should be, Captive, you don't have to be captive anymore. Blind, you don't have to be blind anymore. Poor, you don't have to be poor anymore. Prisoner, you don't have to be locked up in your own body anymore. If that isn't the preacher's message, did he stop where it was comfortable enough to live the good life, forgetting the desperate needs, lying just outside his comfort zone? Doesn't he care about prayer? Is he so caught up in the cares of this world that he thinks he can excuse himself? No excuse will hold water on that day when he stands before Jesus, expecting a big, fat reward, and Jesus asks him, Why didn't you endure in prayer? This is a realm of which few of us have understanding at all. When faced with something like a wheelchair case, we may say, Well, I'm just going to pray and believe God. But if we really believed God when we prayed for that person, why didn't the person get healed? No one knows, not even the person in the wheelchair. But I'll tell you who does know, the Holy Spirit. And as the earnest of our inheritance, He is sent to help us in our in inability to produce results. What does this have to do with intercession? Well, it wasn't until I had been praying for hour after hour in tongues for about two years that I began to experience the deep intercessional groanings of the Spirit coming from deep within my spirit as He willed. I wondered why I heard inside. So God spoke to my spirit. Do you like the plan the devil has for the world? I answered, no I don't. In fact, I heard inside. He said, yes, you are groaning out of your righteous spirit for the culmination of all things and for the redemption of your body. You are groaning to see this whole horrible mess come to an end. I said, yes, sir, you're right. I began to experience hurt that came from deep inside of me every time I walked away from someone in a wheelchair who didn't get healed. I would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus had borne that person's sicknesses and pains. Yet I'd feel the limitations imposed on me by the flesh. Or I would hurt inside when I saw entire civilizations starving to death in plain view of the world. I would want to do something about that person's crippled condition or the sad plight of those desperately poor nations. But I couldn't in my own strength. However, the Holy Spirit could as He moved on my spirit with tongues of deep intercessional groanings activated severally as He willed. The Holy Spirit helps our infirmities. My experience was right in line with Romans 8:26, which says the Spirit also helps our infirmities. That means He helps in conjunction with someone who is already helping. This throws us back to verse 23, where Paul says that we are groaning out of our righteous human spirit. So when Paul says in verse 26, likewise the Spirit also helps us, he is saying, in the same manner that you are growing out of your, groaning out of your human spirit, he will also help you. This is how it works. A mountain comprised of fleshly works stands between you and God's plan for your life. The Holy Spirit will focus in on that mountain with groanings that cannot be uttered. Romans 8.26 You have entered a mild form of intercession, but it is for yourself that you stand in the gap. These groanings are not just referring to speech so profound that you can't utter it. It's also talking about reaching a place in the Spirit where you begin to hate whatever stands between you and God's plan so badly that you enter into a state of groaning or grieving. Your heart cries out, I wish this was out of my life. Lord, I hate this. At this point, you have given the Holy Spirit the faith He needs to come alongside and move the mountain out of the way. If you persevere in prayer and refuse to let the mountain defeat you, at some point you will experience a meltdown where the Holy Ghost removes the mountain and you come out on the other side victorious. Why? Because you cannot continue to report to prayer and still retain your problem. You will either have to quit edifying yourself and yield to those works of the flesh or allow the Holy Spirit to purge them out of your life. The Holy Spirit will pull out the problem at the right time when you're ready and can survive the purging. Your part is to just keep praying. Don't stop. Push through the impasse. 
the Holy Spirit will illuminate, illuminate this purging process for you and when it's all over you'll be able to see and understand that massive mountain that was removed from your life. You will thank God that you are one step closer to mighty intercession. Praying in tongues versus deep intercessional groanings. The combination of the two passages we've been looking at in 2 Corinthians 5 and Romans 8 settled for me the age-old issue of the difference between praying in tongues for personal edification and the deep intercessional groans of the Spirit. That diversity of tongues that is operated by God as He wills. The truth is, even if you start out praying in tongues with a cold, indifferent, stony heart, only two ingredients are necessary to bring you to the place where the Holy Spirit can move through you in deep intercessional groanings. Your knowledge that your indifference is wrong and your decision to pray in the Holy Ghost by your own will as often as possible. As you continue to pray in tongues, the Holy Spirit will edify you and charge you up into the love of God until compassion gets hold of you. Until at times, as you walk away from yet another person still bound to his wheelchair, you feel as if you can't even live unless you see results. This is the kind of groaning that says, I can't stand this anymore. It hurts too badly. I will put aside all of my selfishness and strife and all of our indifferences. I'll do whatever I need to do to serve the purposes of the Holy Spirit. Putting our differences aside is a major part of what delivers us into true intercession. Dead religion consists of, I have my rights, vindicate me. That's where most of the church world lives, and that's why most Christians seldom visit the realm of miracles. Therefore, the gospel of glad tidings doesn't reach that little deformed child bound to a wheelchair. He doesn't get a chance at his reward because the church failed him. But when we get to that place where we groan out of our righteous spirits over this world's pain, sin, and misery, we don't want to fight with anyone anymore. We just want to pray. So why don't we put all our indifferences aside and start praying? It is the groaning of our righteous spirits that the Holy Spirit picks up on. If He examines me and sees that my new nature is crying for help in groanings, hurting but not knowing how to pray as I ought, he says, excuse me, but I have been sent to help your infirmities. I want to add my groanings to your cries for help, for that will translate to pure power for you to rise above the inabilities of the flesh. You have come to a standstill. In your own strength you can't pull this off. You don't have the power. You don't know how to do it. But I do. So the Holy Spirit adds his anointing of of power, his intercession, his groanings, to blend together in unison as, as one with the groanings of your spirit. At that point, he empowers you to rise above the problem and do something about it. In Galatians 4.19, Paul made a revealing statement that provides insight into the distinct difference between tongues for personal edification and deep intercessional groanings. My little children, of whom I travail in birth, again until Christ be formed in you. How many women pick the day to give birth to their child? How many choose the day their baby will be born without man-made intervention? How many stop the process and say, I think I'll wait two days? Not too many, I would imagine. Women can start the childbearing process as they will, but they cannot end it according to their own will. In the same manner, at your own will, you can start the process that will lead to intercession and travail by praying in the Spirit and edifying yourself. But even after you have reached that place of sensitivity in which you've grown out of your righteous spirit because of the imperfections of this world, the deep intercessional groanings of the Holy Spirit only come up on you as He wills. Steps to Intercession Intercession is born in us when the needs of others move our spirit so strongly that we finally give the Holy Spirit something to add His power to. That is when faith, in its purest form, flows from our spirit. Let me tell you the steps that lead to true intercession after you begin the edification process by praying in tongues at your own will. The Holy Spirit will first build you up to that place of sensitivity we've been talking about. 
you will start to look at your husband or wife or lost family member and say, Oh God, above everything else, I would that he or she be saved. At this point, the desires of your heart begin to change in the edification process. You're taking the first steps toward intercession. Although you may think you are directing the Holy Spirit's prayer, you are not. You have your list of prayer requests. Joe needs a car. Susie needs this. Jan needs that. All of those things are almost irrelevant to God. So you sit there with your big list and say, Okay, I claim all these things. When you say, I claim it, God hears it. Then you say, Now I'm going to pray in the Spirit about it. At this point, the desires of your heart begin to direct your prayers rather than your mentality. What did God say? He said that He would grant the desires of your heart if you delighted yourself in Him. Psalms 37, 4 That means that if you delight yourself in the Lord in prayer, the desires you have will come from Him, and these are the desires He can fulfill. As you pray in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will begin to plant a little seed. That is the conception of a miracle. It is the birth plan for your backslidden spouse or your child on dope or a lost relative. He plants that seed directed by the desires of your heart. As you pray in tongues, God will begin to form that little baby by the authority of your spirit. Several months go by, you keep praying, and that miracle growing on the inside of you begins to show as you carry it to fruition. So you don't care if anyone around you is praying or not. You get up early. You pray at all times of the day and night. You walk around and crave spiritual things that you never used to care much about. The months go by as you continue to pray. Suddenly, by an act of God's will and not your own, it's time for birth, and you begin to groan. The labor pains are getting closer and closer. It is only a matter of time before that baby is birthed in the spiritual realm. After long hours of edifying myself through praying in tongues, God began to slip me over into intercession to birth things in the Spirit. For example, I remember a time when the symptom of partial deafness temporarily manifested in my body while I was interceding. That night, a woman who was totally deaf came to my service and God opened her ears. She could hear music and the voices of her husband and son for the first time in her life. Why? Because God was able to bring me to a place in the Spirit where I stood in the gap for this woman's healing. So is it worth the hours and days and months that it takes to build that superstructure in your spirit by praying in tongues so that one day the Holy Ghost can begin to use you with mighty intercession? Oh yes, my friend, it's worth every minute. It is a high honor to stand between Satan and the people he is trying to kill steal from and destroy and nothing can compare to knowing that those you're praying for may have known hell as their eternal destination except that you paid the price to be purged so you could stand in the gap and set the captives free